you want confirmation of the correctness of the Benko Gambit, take a look at the players who play it. World champion Kasparov uses the opening frequently. So do Gelfand, Adams, Fedorowicz and Hodgson. They can't all be wrong. In fact, such is the strength of Black's position in the Benko Gambit accepted that most top players today decline the Gambit. They don't regard acceptance of the Gambit pawn as a particularly practical proposition if they want to win. The Gambit is introduced by the following moves. White plays 1d4, black knight f6, white plays 2c4, and black goes 2c5. White pushes on, 3d5, and now black plays 3b7 to b5. White takes on b5, 4c takes b5, and now black plays a6, gambiting a pawn. And when white takes on a6, that's 5b takes a6, we get the typical position for the Benko gambit accepted. Black can take on a6 immediately, but it's more accurate to play g6 first. And this is the current choice of virtually all the grandmasters who play the gambit. That's 5g6. White generally responds 6 knight c3, and only then does black take on a6, having avoided some dangerous white options. Now I'm going to divide the theory into three major sections. In the first section, white will fianchetto his king bishop. In the second section, white will play for an early e4. And in the third section, white will try to prepare the move e4 by playing either knight f3 to d2 or f4 followed by knight f3. Take a look at this position. Black has no less than four lines of attack against the white pawn structure. Firstly, and most importantly, black will attack with his major pieces on both the A and B files. He's going to put his queen on either B6 or A5, and in each case, follow up with rook F to B8. There you see the black major pieces powering down the A and B files. Added to this strong pressure on the A and B files, black has two tremendous diagonals for his bishops. The A6 bishop, as you can see, is very strong, putting pressure on the E2 pawn, and black has only to move his knight from F6, let's put it on E8, and then you can see the bishop on G7 also has a tremendous future. So black's operating on the A and B files with his major pieces, and his bishops a zigzagging into white's position, putting pressure on e2 and b2, the sensitive pawns. Having said that, it's not as straightforward as it seems to attack the white position. The knights have a very important role to play if black is to mount a successful attack. Let's take all the knights off the board as an experiment and put black's major pieces on the queenside files as indicated earlier. Now take a look at the position. I would say black's game has improved dramatically with the exchange of all the knights, mainly because it's very difficult for white to hold his queenside together at this point. The knight on c3 was obstructing black along the diagonal, the long diagonal, and black simply got rid of it. Therefore the pressure against b2 is now very, very strong, and it's really difficult for white to hold his game together should all the knights get exchanged off the board. Black has various ways to achieve his goal of exchanging the knights. Let's see some of them. One manoeuvre from the diagram position is knight e8 to c7 and then knight to b5. That's a rather long-winded manoeuvre, but black often employs this idea. Another idea is knight d7 to b6 and then to a4. Although in this case, the bishop on a6 impedes black a little, so presumably, if black were to go through with this knight manoeuvre, the light square bishops would have been taken off the board a little bit earlier. Finally, if we give white a couple of moves here, rook e1, and then e4, another idea for black is to play knight f6 to g4. The point of this is that if white now plays h3, 
the knight drops back to e5. Knight takes knight by white. And then black captures knight takes knight. This time, black has exchanged off white's king's knight. But the knight on e5 is becoming a very powerful piece. Entrenching itself in white's position on either d3 or c4. And in each case, we see the harmonious coordination of black's pieces against the white queen side. It may seem surprising that black takes great pains to exchange off the pieces, but it's a paradox of the Benko gambit that with each exchange of knights, black's position improves. Take a look at this position. I'm playing black against international master Andrew Muir at the British Championship 1985. Who stands better in this position? Black's pieces are certainly active, but he's still a pawn down. I decided to attack before white could activate the rook on a1. So black played queen f5 with a double attack. White played rook d2 and black played rook e8 hitting the queen. The queen went to c3. Black's rook went into e4 and white tried to get his rook active on a1 by playing the defensive move a3 first. Right, now we're reaching a position where white's threatening to activate the rook so black must attack. h5 was played. King g2 and black played the strong attacking move rook on a8 to a4 white now activated the rook on a1 rook a d1 and black continued with the initiative by playing h4 now it's getting really difficult for, for white what he should probably play is queen f3 but he made the understandable mistake of playing g4 OK, white's well, still a pawn up, but look at his king side, full of holes. So, queen g5, presumably threatening f5. White played f3. And black played the strong move, rook e5. Well, suddenly white's lost. The threat now is queen f4 to g3. And it's really difficult for white to defend against that. Maybe it's impossible. Muir tried f4. But after rook takes f4. Rook f1. Rook takes f1. King takes f1. Rook e3. White was forced to resign. The queen is attacked on c3, white's pawn is attacked on h3, and black's queen is threatening to infiltrate with queen to f4. All of these, th these threats combined give white a totally lost position. Here's a second instructive example of black's play. It comes from the old game between Mechig and Zabo, played in 1970 in Buenos Aires. In those days, players tended to accept the gambit. Now this may seem an old game to you, but at the time, these were two of the best players in the world, and the quality of play is high. Black's a pawn down, he's got his active pieces on the queen side, white's pawn structure is a little bit loose, and the rook on a3 is passive. All things considered, black is probably slightly better here. Mecking saw a tactic, and he played a5. Now you could argue this is a strong move in the sense that white's trying to do something for the poor rook on a3 but in fact tactically it turns out to be weak because the pawn on a5 soon becomes indefensible. Black responded rook b5 hitting the pawn and white showed his idea. He played queen c4. Black played rook a8 and white went 
B4. OK, purely tactical move, but Black had a good response. Rook takes A5. Now, White's Queen is under attack. So he had to exchange off the Queens. Queen takes A6. Black played Rook 5 takes A6. Rook takes A6. And then Rook takes A6. Taking stock of the situation, we see that the only difference between the two positions is that White's position is much looser than Black's. And this is a common theme in Benko Gambit endings. Suddenly, Black wins back his pawn, his position's together, White's position is very loose. Look at the knight on a2, the rook on e3, the white pawn structure, just ready to be attacked. Of course, the move White would like to play now is b takes c5. But as that loses the knight, White can't do it. If the knight moves on a2, White loses the pawn on b4. So White's next move is forced, but it's a rather horrible move to have to play. Mecking played rook e2. Well, I spoke about the looseness of White's position, so it's not surprising now that Black has a tactic which ruins White's game. Zabo played, Knight takes e4. B takes c5. And Black took back with the d-pawn. D takes c5. Well, Mecking took one look at this position and thought, a few moves ago I was a pawn up, now I'm a pawn down. Black threatens f5, my knight on a2 is, is rubbish, I may as well just take my chances in the rook ending. But that wasn't good enough. He played rook takes e4, rook takes a2 check, king f3, strong move by black now, rook a3 check, driving the white king back, king g2, and black played king f8. Rook c4 was played. Black defended with rook a5. King f3. King e8. And making saw the king coming to d6. He tried to do something by playing f5. G takes f5. King f4, king d7, king takes f5, king d6. White's d-pawn is now dropping, really difficult. He tried rook h4, but after king takes d5, rook takes h5, king d4, it becomes totally clear that white is lost. Black's threatening c4 check. If white defends against that, he's got to cope with the threats of king d3, followed by the advance of the c-pawn. It's all a bit much. So uh, very few moves completed the game. Mecking played king g4, rook a6, rook h8, c4, king f3, King d3, and white resigned. Hopeless position. Black can play his rook across to d6, covering the king, and simply advances c-pawn to the end. So there you have it. An excellent example of Benko Gambit endgame play, where black exploits his superior pawn structure. Don't forget at the start of this example, Mecking was a pawn up, but after pushing his queenside pawns, he loosened his position and black was in like a shot. My final introductory snapshot is another illustration of loose pawn structure. It comes from a game between André, a French IM, and John Fedorowicz, one of the world's leading exponents of the Benko in Grandmaster play. Fedorowicz was black, and it came from a tournament in Holland played in 1989. Now you can see that White's adopted a very aggressive stance in the opening. He's pushed his pawns up and deliberately kept his king in the middle. In particular, he wants to play his king to c2, to defend b2. This is very unusual. Fedorowicz tried to exploit the strange position of the white king by playing knight g4. 
Now, we know that threatens a fork on f2, but that's not the main point. White played king c2, and now a very strong move by black, c5 to c4. Now we can see that the position of the white king on c2 is not so great, because black has numerous threats here. The main one is knight c5 to d3. We saw something like this in our earlier example, this particular manoeuvre. Putting the knight back on d7, if we couple this idea with rook to b8, then you can see the pressure mounting against the queen side, in particular b2 once again. Maybe in this type of position the rook on a6 can go to b6, and there's even more pressure there. White's got to be very careful here, defending against all these black threats. So after this very strong move, white played rook h to e1. And not surprisingly, there came knight c5. White put his rook on e1 to be able to play now rook e2. And then black played his knight into d3, as we expected. Pawn to h3. And Fedora was just dropped back. Knight to f6. Well, as the knight on d3 is fouling white's position up completely, Andre decided to try and exchange it off. And this explains his next move, knight e1. Fedorowicz felt that it was probably a good idea to retain the knight, so he played knight d3 to c5. But in his own notes of the game, he mentions another possibility which he felt was stronger. And that is rook to b8. After all, that's a perfectly natural move. Then comes knight takes d3, c takes d3 check, king takes d3, rook takes b2, rook b1, rook takes b1, knight takes b1, and then rook takes a2. Fedorowicz feels that black is better here, and I have to agree with him, for several reasons. Firstly, the rook on a2 is much more active than the rook on e2. Furthermore, black threatens knight d7 to c5, putting pressure against the white king. And the final point, and common point in the Benko, is that black's pawn structure is simply better than white's. It's more compact, it's more flexible, and the white pawns are there, ready to be attacked, whereas it's difficult to say the same for black. So all these things combined mean that probably Fedorowicz, after knight e1, should have played this variation. Back at the game, Fedorowicz chose knight c5, and the Frenchman lashed out with e5. Now whether this was an attacking gesture, or merely an attempt to keep the bishop on g7 under control, is difficult to say. But it does continue to make white's pawn structure extremely loose. Black played knight fd7, just dropping back, and white played bishop e3. Now black's rook came across to b8, rook b8. So what have we got here? We've got the usual Benko Gambic pressure with white's king in the firing line. Can this be good for white? I very much doubt it. Bishop takes c5. Of course black takes back with the knight, knight takes c5. And white played rook d1. Now comes a move which should be familiar to you. Fedorowicz played knight a4. Right, double attack, hitting the pawn at b2 and the knight on c3. So knight takes a4, rook takes a4. And now we reach a critical position. What white probably should play now is the very defensive move a3. Fedora, which then gives c3, exposing the white king further. King takes c3. Rook takes f4. Knight d3. And then rook a4. Feeling that black holds the advantage because of white's exposed king. 
but he feels White had to play like this. He had to take his chances in this position. Because after all, if White survives the attack, then he's got two passed pawns on the queen side to look forward to. It's doubtful, however, whether with his king on c3, he could actually survive. Because the king will probably have to backpedal, and then black's going to win the e-pawn. So with a3 missed, Andre played rook a1. A horrible move. I mean, you don't want to play moves like that, do you? And black played rook a5, exposing white's d-pawn, which Andre gratuitously weakened when he played e4, e5. King c3, rook takes d5, king takes c4, e6. Well, still a pawn down, black, but look at that pressure. Tremendous pressure from the rooks. The only developed white piece really is the king. White tried to bring his knight back into the game with knight f3. Rook c8 check. King went to b3. And then rook b5 check. King a4. And rook c b8. Well, would you like to be in this position with white? No, neither would I. Well, it's not surprising that under such pressure, the end came quickly. Andre now cracked up under the pressure, playing e takes d6. Hardly surprising with his king out there like that. And Fedorowicz played rook 5 to b7, with unstoppable mate threats of either rook a7 or rook a8. Proof positive that white can't play like this against the Benko Gambit. He has to get his king out of the middle. This is Grandmaster Damien Lemos here for OnlineChessLessons.net. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course the 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from OnlineChessLessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving your chess without um, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more, this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net and I'll see you um, in my videos. Thank you.